Thank you for joining me for another episode of Empower Apps Show. My name is Leo Dion. You can follow me on Twitter at Leo G. Dion. I run Bright Digit doing iOS and Swift development and all sorts of fun stuff in the Apple space. Today we have with us Paul Hudson from HackingWithSwift.com. Hey, Paul. Hey, how are you doing? Good. So you just got back from uh, another conference, correct? I did. iOS Conf SG. How was it? It was hot. <laughs> I mean, hot as in lots of fun, but hot, come on, it's Singapore, it's hot year round. But it's a great event because I think it's the biggest in Southeast Asia, which means you meet folks from Singapore, obviously, but Malaysia as well, Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines, India, Australia. They all come together to this one sort of hub the conference. I'm really curious what different perspectives they bring in that part of the world that we don't commonly see in like North American, Europe conference set. Yeah. So what I found generally is that you'll always get a range of views or a range of perspectives and such, which is great. For example, if I'm meeting Indian colleagues, they have a remarkable, remarkable work ethic. They will come armed with questions to ask me. You know, a lot of folks say, oh, hi, it's Paul. Hi, Paul. Um, you know, I listen to your podcast or, or your site, whatever. That's cool. Thank you very much. And that's great. If you want to do that, fine. I'll chat and you can show me your code and I can, can chat about stuff. That's great. They'll come armed with questions. If you're from India, you will come with questions, like really specific things about this, or this, this, this. What's your view? What's your view? What's your view? And that's fantastic. I love that because everyone's project is different. Everyone's team is different. And it gives me a really broad idea of where people are going around the world. So I really enjoy that kind of experience. Yeah, it's really interesting. It almost sounds like you're in one of these WWDC labs where it's like you're one of the Apple developers and they're asking you a specific API. But that sounds like they're very specific about what they need help with. Yeah, and absolutely, because these are expensive events. Yeah. When folks ask me, you know, hey, I'm thinking about going to speak somewhere, what advice can you give me? The most common thing I'll say to them is you got to turn up to everything you can. Be there for people because they're paying three, four, five hundred bucks a shot to get into this event. And the talks are nice, but the talks are also available later on YouTube most of the time. And so when they speak at a conference, I say, listen, you've got to go along, be there every break, be there every party, every pre-event, every after event to give folks maximum chance to ask you questions, show you their code, get your opinions and stuff. So they can get a range of views. And there are speakers who do this. You see them, they'll arrive late, they'll deliver their talk, and then they'll, you know, ghost immediately. And it's disappointing because those attendees are here to talk to us and ask us questions and show us their code. So, you know, make the most of it. That's awesome. It's like really hard, I think, for some developers to do that. Like I go to a couple of more business-centered conferences where it's pretty common for everybody to come to post parties and like pre-shows and like do a little bit of networking and talk and hang out for like breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I think it's a little bit harder for developers to get that kind of like FaceTime. It's not as common. That's the biggest difference I've noticed between like a developer centered conference and more like a business centered conference. Maybe, yeah. Carolyn Nitz gave me two great pieces of advice in this, and she's a, a wonderful speaker. First thing she does is she sits, sits in the front row so that the speaker who comes on, you know, you normally know who it is. They know you, you've hung out beforehand, whatever. But they're seeing friendly faces, smiling, clapping, cheering along with them. So it's very encouraging to see someone in the front row. So that's the first piece of advice. You know, if you're a speaker, sit near the front so that you can support the other speakers who are maybe stressed out or tired or worried or anxious or whatever it is. And the second piece, is, which is really germane here, is she has this thing, and I've totally, totally copied this from her, which is during the breaks, just wander around aimlessly. Go into the main networking area and wander around aimlessly. Because so many people, they're polite, they're nice people. They see you talking to another speaker or a friend, whatever, and they won't want to interrupt you. They won't want to say, listen, oh, they look, they look really busy. I don't want to take away from that time. Whereas if you actively choose to wander around aimlessly, I'm doing nothing, just staring into space, you're giving a really clear signal, come and talk to me. I'm free ask me your questions, show me your code, whatever it is, let's just hang out. And it's worked wonders. It signals to people that you're available. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We met in person back in August in Toronto. And, yeah, uh, great event. That was a really great event. I don't know if people know Kyle posted, Kyle Newhouse, whose uh, guest talked about continuous integration a few months ago, but he posted his uh, 
kind of like a postmortem of Swift Toronto. And I always find that stuff really fascinating. I don't know how you do it with the live event that you got in the summer, but like organizing conferences is always seems like a real challenge. And I always find that stuff really interesting. What are the biggest mistakes that conference organizers usually get into when they organize a conference? You've got to keep in mind, you know, I ran my own event in July 2019, our first version, and we sold out, which was great. And I'm doing it again this July. Both are for charity. All our money goes to charity we raise. And folks have asked me, hey, you know, Paul, you should do a blog post. You should uh, tell us how you went from zero to selling out in your first year. Give us your secrets. And I could do that. Of course I could do that. But it really wouldn't be fair because in the last two and a bit years, I've must have spoken at 30 or 35 events, okay? With a new talk each time. I never repeat talks unless I get asked to. So I've spoken at a lot of events, which means I'm friends with lots and lots and lots of speakers. So when it came to organizing my event, I pick up the phone, email, oh, hey, so-and-so, how are you doing? Haven't seen you in a few months. Do you want to come and talk at my event? And they say, yeah. So for me, getting speakers was trivial because they're my friends. We hang out all the time. And similarly, selling tickets was very, very easy for me because I've got this very large website. We've got just past 2 million page views every month now on hackingwithstuff.com. Wow. So it's very, very easy for me to market my event to people. So it's deeply unfair me giving folks advice on how to do conferences because I have this very comfortable position. So when it comes to mistakes, I'm sure there are stacks of mistakes you can make, but I wouldn't necessarily want to pick on particular events because I know how hard these these folks work. You know, I've seen the stress and the anxiety and the worry and the pressure of selling out and making sure everyone has a good time. And of course there are mistakes, but we all go with the flow. No one really is picking at people and saying, oh, this was a terrible event and so forth, because we know how hard they're all working. So maybe I'll turn that question around. What do you think are some of the things that you've seen done at conferences that you're like, wow, that's a really good idea. I'm glad they thought of that. Oh, so I could pick out stacks of things for that. I mean, for example, if you are thinking of organizing a conference, I'll tell you now, your number one responsibility is to make sure the attendees are happy. And that sounds obvious, but you can go to places where the organizers are Swift coders themselves, of course they are most of the time, and they will be very, very keen to do the same thing the attendees want to do, which is to show off their code, ask questions, share ideas with the speakers. And that's great. I make as much time as I can to speak to as many people as I can. But ultimately, me being happy in an event, me being having a good time, is secondary to those folks who paid a lot of money to be there. Because some of these tickets are extremely expensive. And so yes. if you are thinking of organizing an event, your number one thing to do, to talk to, to hang out with, is not the speakers. Go and talk to the attendees. It's so important to make sure they're having a good time and really getting the most from the event. I can say it's very interesting watching the variety of styles of events because if we compare something like Dot .swift in Paris, which is actually like any day now, actually, I think it's early February, they have a TED-style event where it's 18 minutes per talk, 1-8. And that works really, really well because they say to everyone, hey, listen, it's only 18 minutes per talk. That means you've got to focus the entire time. There's no chit-chat. There's no, we're hiring. There's no sort of like, here's my bio Instead, you've got to focus. And so turn your phone off. Close your laptop lid. I want every screen off during the talk. Including the speaker? Now, the speaker, of course, has a laptop with the notes on and stuff. But uh, everyone's focused on the speaker. And they have these remarkable venues. They choose like opera halls and such. And so the speaker is basically on their A game. There's no time for last minute prep. You're going to nail this talk or nothing, basically. And that works really, really well. So, I mean, there are all sorts of styles that work well. And that's just one of them. Well, wow, Paris must be a really interesting location. What are some other locations that you found really interesting or like held in really cool places? Gosh, I've been to so many lovely places with conferences. I just got back from Singapore yesterday and Singapore is an astonishing country. I posted a video of the remarkable dual at Changi waterfall they have. So the world's largest waterfall, right? It's an astonishing place, Singapore, in every imaginable, conceivable way. But I've got a lot of time for the Swiss conferences. I think they're very, very good. They pioneered the Swift Alps 
which is an astonishingly good conference. And it's one of those things where I can imagine it being very hard to go to as an attendee because, hey, boss, I want to go to this conference. And they go, yeah, okay, good. Is it in London? Is it, you know, is it in Paris? Oh, no, no, it's the Swift <laughs> Alps. When you say that, it sounds like basically you want to go in a Beano somewhere, a nice jolly little time in the Alps, go from skiing, and then somewhere in there learn some Swift. And of course there is that. We went curling when I was there. Wow. And you stay in the Alps. You're really, really oh, high awesome. up. You get a long, long trip upwards, and it's gorgeous up there. But putting that to one side, it is an amazing conference. I think it is, in terms of volume of stuff you will learn, that format they pioneered is by far and away the best. Because it's a very simple idea. You have two days, and on each of those days, there are four mentors running workshops, each lasting two hours. So on day one, there are four workshops of two hours each. You can choose three of those to go to. You choose A, B, and C, and not D, for example. And on day, do, day two, there's there's four different mentors, each doing two-hour workshops. And in every workshop, you're paired with somebody else, and they give you a brief intro of what you'll be doing, and then it's basically go and do some coding following their guidance. And when you hit problems, you ask questions, the mentor answers questions, and you move on. But it means that after those two days, You've had six two-hour workshops on different topics with all your questions answered, where you walk away with codes you have written, and where you've paired with different person every time. So you meet a lot of folks, you write a lot of code, and you walk away with lots of new skills. It works so well. And it's no surprise that Swift Aviro or Swift Island have totally cloned that format because it works so very well. That's awesome. So like, it sounds like they have like a lot more hands-on help along with the talks. Does that sound right? There are no talks. There, there are, are no, no talks. talks. It's okay. all workshop wow. driven. Okay. That's fantastic. So one thing I wanted to ask before we close out this discussion on conferences is, so I spoke at a conference a couple of weeks ago called Code Mash here in the US. Like just a developer conference, not Swift focused at all. I was one of three Swift speakers out of probably like 20 or 30 speakers total. So. Swift was a small slice of that. But what I loved about this conference was they actually had like a kids conference going on at the same time. So I brought my two oldest and the misses as well. And they got to learn about like 3D printing and like all sorts of different like maker stuff. And we got to play board games as well during downtime, which I feel like is really cool to have like a little bit more of a family like atmosphere to a lot of these conferences, because in a lot of cases, you know, it's difficult sometimes to go to a conference and leave the missus with your five kids at home, especially during the school year. And I know that you, you sometimes bring your daughter, correct, to some of your conferences. Like, what are some tips you have for dads and moms who, you know, might bring their family along, especially to one of these fantastic sites? So as much as I love the Swift community, I want everyone to think about whether we really are as inclusive as we could be. Because it's so easy to get carried away and assume, yes, we are. I am a straight, white, middle-aged male from a wealthy Western country, <laughs> right? So for me, I've got fairly easy right. going life. But I can go, yeah, we're fine. We're totally inclusive without recognizing the many areas we fall short or other conferences do better. For example, I took my eldest to PyCon last year, a Python convention in the UK, and they knock it out of the park in terms of accessibility and in inclusion. For everyone who attends, they have a free crash on all the days of the event. It's many, many, it's actually quite a long event. All days, not just children's days, all days have registered, qualified childminders during the conference hours for everyone, free of charge, guaranteed. They have dedicated breastfeeding rooms for <sighs> nursing See, mothers. Yeah, that's awesome. They have speech-to-text transcription being typed out as someone's speaking in the auditorium. They have induction loops for hearing aid users. They provide sign language on request for anyone who wants it. They have they can, special seats to get at the front so you can see the screen more easily if you've got vision support. They have step-free access to all the rooms. They have all dietary requirements. They've got a quiet room. They've got all sorts of things. Plus, on top of that, grants, financial grants to help people get there, travel, stay, and conference tickets. So it, it's remarkable what they're doing. And that's Python. Now, obviously, Python's an older, more mature language. But 
We think about the general cost of being an iOS developer. We know we're fairly wealthy full stop because you've got to buy a MacBook or a MacBook Pro or a right. Mac Mini. You've got to get an iPhone or an iPad. You know, we're already significantly above the average in terms of income and spending. And yet we don't provide these services. So I really wish folks would go to these kinds of other conferences and see, wait, wow, this is way, way better than we're doing in Swift. How can we get there? So I do take my kids if possible and it's fun. And actually, I'd like to see my eldest deliver a talk soon. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Um, because she's really, she's getting getting confident and getting somewhere. I've got an idea where I might take her. I'm going to find out how child-friendly they are first, obviously, because <laughs> otherwise it might backfire. She's very keen to go to Singapore because Singapore has a Pokemon center in the uh, wow. one of the malls near the airport. So, uh, yeah, we'll yeah, see. Yeah, like this conference, Codemash, it was held at a water park, which is fantastic. So they didn't have to go to every talk. They had movie nights. For the kids, they had all sorts of activities, learning how to do like, these paper cube things and all sorts of different like kid centric maker type activities. And it's just it's difficult. Some of these conferences are just very like they're a little bit white collar work centered, which I un- totally understand in a lot of ways. And l- going back to your discussion about like how difficult it is to put on a conference, like it's difficult enough just putting on a conference, let alone make it more family friendly. But It would be nice if there were a few conferences where it's like, hey, we have activities for kids. Like, I mean, Apple constantly, I don't know about in your area, but I know like I see these events at the Apple store that where they try to teach programming to kids on, you know, using iPads and playgrounds. And it's like, why are we doing more like this kind of stuff with kids where they can get just get an iPad and learn very, very basic programming and how to do stuff with robotics at one of these Swift conferences? Because that would be a great opportunity to get the younger generation involved as well. Yeah, I think one of the big things that Python can do, which we're still not there yet, is they already have a very large child-friendly community. You know, we went to PyCon on Children's Day, which is a day dedicated for children, and they had two simultaneous classrooms running, building robotic stuff with Scratch and then Python mostly, but a little bit here and there, drag and drop stuff. And it was all sorts of a range of stuff, but it was done by teachers, as in professional teachers who would normally teach Python at school. We're now teaching Python on this uh, workshop day. And we don't have many teachers, certainly here in the UK, who are doing Swift playgrounds or Xcode, whatever it is, at that age group yet. And yeah, fine, 16, 17, 18, maybe even 15, 14, a little bit. There are some. But Python is going way younger. You know, certainly at 10 here in the UK, you'll have done some Python at school and 11 guaranteed. So it's got a more sizable footprint, I think. And of course, that goes back to your whole point earlier about how if you're an Apple developer, you probably have like a higher income because like the requirements, the hill you have to climb to get into Swift development is financially a little bit higher because you always need more equipment and like most schools just don't have the budget to spend on like necessarily getting the right equipment for Swift development. So I could see how that makes a lot of sense. I do wish Apple would really hack back the price of the Mac Mini. Give us a starter Mac Mini. Do the next, you know, spec bump whenever it is to the Mac Mini, but keep the current one on like an iPhone SE, a Mac SE, whatever it is that anyone can get into because it it lowers the bar for folks coming into our community, which is always going to be a nice thing to have. Yeah, and all the things you can do to make Swift accessible, I feel like price is probably one of the biggest things Apple can do if they really want to get Swift to have a wider audience. Yeah, and in London last year, iOS Con, I was there, I did a live podcast with Sean Allen, and during the podcast I mentioned one of the people I'd met who was a little girl, and I said, hey, this girl here, she's doing amazing work, go and see her code. She's only, uh, I think, was it? 13, 14 or something at the time. Uh, her name's Connie, and she's doing amazing work. And, you know, her story was remarkable. She had a 2011, I think, MacBook Air. Wow. So it wasn't powerful when it launched in 2011, and now it was, you know, very, very slow. And so it couldn't handle most of the work she wanted to do. And so she would go into town to the Apple store to use their iPads to do Swift learning <laughs> and Swift programming. <laughs> and so awesome. Sean very kindly said he was going to buy her a new MacBook Pro, and he did. And it now means she's up there coding whatever she wants to, thanks to that really transformative gift from Sean. But you can see when someone wants to learn, nothing is going to stop them. But anything we can do to help them and encourage them and give them the support and hardware and software they need to get moving would be obviously very helpful indeed. Yeah, exactly. 
Hey, I wanted to let you know that Empower App Show is looking for sponsors and patrons. Our audience is growing and we'd love to showcase you, your company, and your product on our show. If you want to be a patron, you can find us at patreon.com slash empowerapps.show. Or if you want to be a sponsor, reach out to me personally at leo at brightdigit.com. Your support is greatly appreciated, and we look forward to showcasing your business and product on our show. So speaking of learning Swift and getting started, a lot of people are interested in like upgrading their skills this year in 2020. Especially this year, what are you think are some unique things that people should do in 2020 to upgrade their skills? Well, I think everyone's at a different level. And I see all sorts of people tweeting me or emailing me or often face-to-face saying, Paul, how do you do what you do? How are you so productive? How do you write and record and whatever so much? And my answer is, I think, pretty blunt, pretty straightforward, which is that this is my full-time job. I don't have a Jira backlog. I don't have daily stand-ups. I don't have one-to-one meetings or emails to answer or whatever. All I do is sit and noodle with Swift all day and write what I like. And so folks need to look at themselves and say, where do they want to be? Not look at me or look at you know Ray Wendelick or somebody else and say, yeah, I want to be like that person. Where do they want to be in a year? And if that answer is, hey, I am totally comfortable where I am, fine. But honestly, the answer is probably not that because one of the things that working in a technical industry, particularly these days, means is that you are attached to the treadmill of Apple or Microsoft or Google or Amazon or some massive company who's moving extremely quickly. And so if you do stay where you are for a year, fine, you lose a little bit, not much. But after three years, your code probably doesn't compile anymore because it's changing so quickly. Or your APIs are now deprecated. All those new cool things you aren't using that the act users are demanding. I mean, things like dark mode. If you don't support that, you'll get some angry users. You yes. just will. <laughs> and so you can't really stay still. So I encourage folks to think about, you know, where do you want to be in a year? And think, well, I'd, I'd like to be a, a senior developer or I'd like to be a, a not junior developer at least, you know, some rank higher in my company. Or I'd like to have some project management skills or broaden my skill set somehow. Think about that as your end result and then think about how you want to get there. And that is always, that's always a smarter way of doing it. Because the other other option is the high jump approach, like at the Olympics where you jump two meters, then 2.1, then 2.2. And it's basically the same thing you're doing before, now just slightly more of it, now slightly higher of it. Whereas with the where you want to be in a year approach, it's much clearer. I want to get to that point and then work backwards from there, step by step, how do I get to there? And that gives you more interesting results, I think. I mean, you could also just like ask people who are in position. Well, obviously, folks are asking you, but if you're looking at a position in a company, asking people, people want to be helpful. Like a lot of the times they want to do whatever they can to help you. If you're at a company and you see somebody in a position that you're interested in, ask them, like, how did you get into that position? What skills do you think I need? Take that opportunity, especially if you're doing like an employee review, to ask those questions. Definitely, yeah. The other thing I was going to say, and I don't want to scare people, but this is just a fact of life in the 21st century. We had Steve Lipton on a few weeks ago talking about the Red Queen Dilemma. But I have been at several companies and have survived several rounds of layoffs. And I can tell you, just like every other job, you need to have like some sort of continuing education. It's not just because new APIs come out, but also you need to constantly broaden your knowledge set and upgrade your knowledge set if you want to be stable at your company. It's not just scaring people, but I think like, there's an obligation to like continually learn new things if you're in technology, just as you would if you're a lawyer, like you have to stay up to date on cases or a doctor and you have to stay up to date on medical innovations. I think like you have that obligation as well, like just being in the software industry. I agree. I'd probably add the note of caution that it's not always about reaching for what's next. Even though what's next might be deeply exciting, often consolidating what you have is as good. Yes. For example, I have last year run the 100 days of Swift and then 100 days of Swift UI. So 200 days of you know new material across the year. And a lot of folks would go, well, you know, days 1 through 15, that's just learning Swift. I know Swift already. 
And I reply saying, no, no, you do those first 15 days again. You consolidate your Swift, see what you get from it. And often they'd learn stuff. They'd say, wow, I didn't know you could use underscores and numbers, or I didn't know how multi-line strings worked in Swift. Things that had happened in Swift that, you know, a year, two, even three years ago, that they hadn't noticed or had noticed and forgotten because they were so busy fixing bugs or delivering new revenue features and actually important stuff. So it's easy to get stuck in the mindset where you think, oh, wow, ARKit or uh, Core ML or SwiftUI. And those are all really cool things. I love SwiftUI. It's great fun to work with. But if you are also thinking, you know, I'm going to go back and really, really learn testing. I'm going to go back and really thoroughly learn my design patterns, my algorithms, or whatever it is. Things that it's so easy to take for granted. And, you know, you can go back and learn them, and you'll, you might use them straight away, you might not, I don't know. But it'll keep your brain working hard and thinking hard, you're learning something new. It's not about, wow, I've got to always do Swift UI. Because there's all sorts of other things out there you can learn. Yeah, I want to make that caveat as well. When I say like staying up to date, I don't necessarily mean new content. Like I just mean like keep deep diving even into existing stuff. Like obviously Swift UI and Combiner are the new hotness. So everybody wants to know about that. And I think that's good, but there's still so much information to learn about older stuff or even little tidbits like multi line strings, for instance, that you don't even think about that you're like, wow, this is super powerful and useful to me. And I think like, you know, UI kit is not going to be going away like anytime soon. Like it's going to be around for quite a while and there's still stuff to learn there. Diffable data sources, for instance, like it's a huge big new thing that like kind of been lost over because of Swift UI. So yeah, I agree. Like there's current stuff too that you can even deep dive into. I'm going to ask you, what is something that you have learned in the last, say, week or 30 days or year that has been around in Swift for a while that you were surprised by? Because I always find like there's always something new I learn that I'm like, wait a second, I didn't know about this. What was something that surprised you lately? So actually just um, Saturday, I want to say, yeah, I was noodling around with Swift 5.2, which is, you know, approaching release real soon now. I'm expecting sort of March-ish time. It's not a massive release. You know, 5.1 was... That's huge. the one with the debugging and error. Yeah, that's, that's really right? nice too. That's really nice too. It's one of those things that is going to be forgotten about pretty quickly, I think, because it will just happen. It'll become the new normal. It's like, remember Swift 1.0 when it was like, source kit service crashed, source kit service crashed. And it was horrible for a long time. And then it just got fixed and then we all forgot about it. Right. That'll be the errors thing because right now it's a bit of a nightmare in Swift UI. That'll just be fixed and we'll go, hooray, yes. it's amazing. And then forget about it. <laughs> Sadly, it's great stuff, great work, amazing work by our team, but we'll not be thinking about it in two years' time for sure. <laughs> I was thinking actually a wonderful change done by um, Stephen Sellis and Greg Titus which is in 5.2, which is really, really nice. It's actually it's right up Stephen's uh, street. The way you can now use key paths in functions instead of closures. And so you can now say, here is a user struct that has a name and an age and a date of birth and whatever job you know, properties here. And we've known for a long time, you could say, here's an array of users, now do dot map and call map on that array and give it a closure of stuff to do. Now you can put key paths directly into map. You can say map on nice. title. And you get back, you know, uh, master, lord, sir, mister, miss, whatever it happens to be, right, your title, immediately. And it, it makes for extremely short ways of filtering, of mapping, and compact mapping. And even actually remove all support as well. So you could say, you know, remove all where name is Boolean true or something, for example, is now just a one-liner. Yeah, I know they've implemented a lot of that with Combine. I know, like, for instance, Map, you can supply either a closure or a key path. So it sounds like they're implementing this globally towards every one of these, like, mapping functional methods. Is that correct? Well, it's more that it's a step towards, I think, consistency in Swift. Because Swift has evolved at a breakneck pace, quite frankly. Every version of Swift for the last two years has been huge. You know, 4.1, 4.2, 5.1, particularly 5.0 even, with results and similar, has been huge. And I think it's left us in a situation where, because Swift is released incrementally, three times a year, 5.1, 5.2, and then, you know, 6 or 5.0, whereas UIKit, AppKit, and similar are not, they're released monolithically at DubDub, we have this situation where our APIs don't necessarily match the language. For example, mm, we still right. have URL session 
which gives you the hideous response data error trifecta coming in. And <laughs> it should be result. And it isn't result because it's in its own little world away from, from Swift. So it's problematic. Yeah, it uses the classic... It has that weird mapping of what Objective-C used to do over to like a Swift tuple, which is like a little bit strange as opposed to just using a result type, which I love result types. Speaking of which, I just I want to plug your talk from Swift Toronto if you're interested in the history of Swift and you want to hear Paul insult an entire nation's <laughs> sport, which I found amazing as somebody who lives just right across the border that you would have the guts to do that while standing on a chair. Definitely check out Paul's talk on the history of Swift. It's really fascinating. And I recently was upgrading in a Swift 2 project uh, a couple of months ago, which I fl- had all these flashbacks to your talk because I was like, oh my gosh, they didn't have generics. Oh my gosh, they don't have try catch and any sort of error handling. And it was like all these flashbacks to your talk because I started remembering like there were so many things we didn't have when Swift first started off. Yeah, I still have Swift 1 code. I mean, Swift 1 had generics, but it didn't have try catch, didn't have guard. It had the pyramid of unwrapped doom with if let. There were so many things, even things like native sets. We had to use NS set like animals, right? Which wasn't great. Yeah, like this code had NS array, like all, all of that stuff, and it didn't have any generics in it. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, definitely check out. Paul's talk. I'll post a link to that in the show notes. Actually, someone asked me a question in Singapore. They said they had um, had a Swift 3 project and they want to upgrade it. And they asked, you know, when's the right time to upgrade that project? And the answer was, hmm, about two years ago. Right, right. <laughs> um, because broadly speaking, if you are actively maintaining a, an app, you want to keep on moving it forward with Swift because at some point, APIs will go away or be deprecated or the language will change. And you've got to be careful because Xcode doesn't keep around its backwards compatibility for a very long time. Right. You'll get one version, maybe two versions, and then Xcode will say, mm, sorry, install an old version of Xcode if you want to migrate this any further. Yep. And the bigger problem actually normally is that, I mean, Xcode can do, you know, give me four, here's four oh, give me four one, or here's four two, whatever. They can do that kind of migration fairly straightforwardly. But the bigger issue I think people find is they start missing out on idiomatic Swift because Xcode will change NS attributed string key to NS attributed string dot key. They can do that, you know, and it's sleep, that's fine. But it can't make you switch across to codable or multi-line strings or the result type. Uh, those are new language features that it won't do for you. So you've got to keep those in mind as well. You know, cleaning up your code, keep it fresh. It will make it work, but it's not going to make it optimized or using the latest patterns and practices. Yeah, and, you know, obviously do what's right for your project. You don't. I don't particularly like it when libraries always bump up the Swift 5.1. They set the target to 5.1 for no reason. Nothing's changed. Nothing's breaking in there because that actually hurts a lot of folks who are companies who can't get to the new Swift version. So if you are stuck in an old Swift version, fine, but you don't want to be stuck too long. You don't have a migration plan in place there because it will be too old at some point to move across with using Xcode. Yeah. I had to get a VM with the High Sierra on it and then I had to download Xcode 8 and then I had to like change the date time because Apple never updates their certificates. So upgrading old projects, it's it's not fun, but it's pretty much necessary at this point. Yeah. So we could talk a lot about some of the tech skills that folks can update, but in a lot of cases, especially if we're talking about like a manager or a project manager, there might be some soft skills that folks can upgrade as well, right? I'm hesitating because I dislike the term soft skills. I think it minimizes what are, in fact, extremely hard skills. And we have stereotypically ignored them for a very long time to our peril. Which term should I use instead? The common one I try and stick to is things like core skills. Learning to talk to people around you in a good, positive, optimistic way with a direction which is encouraging and supportive and uh, it's still critical. You also help make them get better, but you're not there to pull them down. You have to bring them up. That's a real skill. That's a hard skill. I can teach someone Swift. I can totally teach someone Swift, but teaching someone not to be a jerk, that's harder. <laughs> and so, you know, these core skills, learning to communicate, to make time for people, to manage projects well, is challenging, I think. I think to me, like, I, when I think of soft, I don't necessarily think easy. Well, 
I think that term comes from is the ambiguity of it. But yeah, it definitely is core skills. Like you're going to hit a ceiling if you don't have a lot of those skills and especially communication, which when, it, you know, you obviously are a pro at communication when it comes to these really technical topics. But I think like you're going to have to talk to folks who are higher up or perhaps stakeholders on a project and communicate some of the needs or changes that need to take place technically to folks who have like no technical skill whatsoever. And that can be really difficult. And that's, I think, a super important skill to pick up. Yeah, I think we all place too much emphasis on someone's coding abilities. Because it matters to us. Of course, we want, we want a good coder on our team. But you know, would you like to have a, a 10 out of 10 coder with a 2 out of 10 communication style? Would you want that? Or, you know, one out of 10 ability to do testing or three out of 10 time management skills. They create a lot of problems. There are out there significantly, significantly better developers than me who are nine or 10 out of 10. Because uh, I, I certainly am not. But I combine my eight, whatever it is, out of 10 with the ability to communicate with people well, to be able to understand commercial pressures and time pressures and similar, to be able to run good teams with supporting management styles and similar. And that, I think, adds up to a stronger whole than I would have had if I just focused on more and more and more code. Yeah. So what do you think are some key communication skills that folks should pick up? Like I'm thinking like email, public speaking, presentations. What am I missing? Well, not everyone's going to want to be a public speaker. And I wouldn't say that everyone should be a public speaker. Yeah. What I would say is that as you move out of a junior developer role, you become more outward facing in your company. If you work in a medium sized or even a large company, at some point, when you move to an intermediate developer, you have to start talking to other teams. You know, when you're a junior developer, you're a code monkey, right? You sit down, here's your code, type this out, here's your task, boom, 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 boom. So I was just giving you work, you're solving the work. You get the next bit of work and doing that instead. I've been there. It's a lot of fun. You just write code all the time. Great. <laughs> but when you move up from that, you try and you know take on bigger work or more chunks of work. You have to start thinking about which tasks you do. You have to start thinking about which one is commercially useful or how it'll be seen by the testing team or whatever. And that might mean giving internal presentations. You know, show off your work to the CTO, for example. And that means being able to have the confidence in your work to think how to present it, to select the strong points and the weak points and present it in a, in a balanced way, give them the information they need to make a good risk assessment on that stuff. And that's hard to do. Of course, when you're a senior developer, then you're the one speaking perhaps to the board directly, going presenting your new thing or you're organizing teams yourself, you're doing one-to-ones, you're running scrum groups or perhaps you're a scrum master or if you do something similar in your company. There are all sorts of roles. And that's when you start to realize that actually... If you are a senior developer, realistically, you should be writing less code than you ever have done for a very, very long time. Because having a senior on a team who's sort of picking out large chunks of work and committing it can be very problematic because no one wants to do critical pull requests because it just doesn't, they're the senior developer. I don't want to have a go at them. Whereas if you focus your time on helping everyone else get to where they need to be, you can have a bigger impact. I think when I say public speaking, Maybe I should make this distinction. I think it's good to develop public speaking skills. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be a public speaker. Because I think there are skills that you can learn from public speaking that would be helpful if you're just talking to a small group of people as well. Are you familiar with Toastmasters? Yeah, we have a tattoo. Okay, cool. So, yeah, it's international. But I did Toastmasters for a few years. And what I found super helpful for me was being able to like organize my thoughts and talk to people in a much more personable manner. So yeah, I do public speaking and I use it for that. But in a lot of cases, you might be in a meeting room with a few people. And one thing that they teach you to do is like doing impromptu speaking where you're just asked a question and having to be able to pick up on that. And I think that can be public speaking skills can be helpful, even if you're not going to end up speaking at a major conference. And I think Mm. like what you're kind of getting at is like presentations, I think are another aspect where you have to like present your own 
present, for instance, how a project is doing, or here's a use case for why we should use Swift UI in a project, for instance. And you might have to like be able to explain that to like just five stakeholders, for instance. I think that could be helpful too in a lot of ways. Yeah, sure. But don't ever think that, oh, wow, I was nervous there. I could never do a full room of people. Fine. That's okay. I'd like you to. I'd like everyone to. But if someone said, well, I can handle five, but I couldn't do 50 or 500, fine. That's okay. We're all called to different things, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree 100%. So we kind of talked a bit about core skills. Let's get into what some people might call the fun part. But what do you think are some... (laughs) (laughs) What do you think are some skills that people should be learning in 2020 when it comes to Swift specifically? Well, let's just get into it. Like the elephant in the room, Swift UI. Do you think everybody should be learning Swift UI in 2020? I think everyone who has a long-term Swift career, which is almost every listener of this podcast, should try out Swift UI. Yes. You need to go and make a new Swift UI project and spend a day, two, three, even a whole week just playing around with it, seeing what it can do. Because when you do that, you'll start to reprogram your brain a little bit because it is a bit like a reprogramming, thinking in almost in the reverse of how you normally would think to get results. And that's going to last you for years in that sort of functional approach. But it'll also lessen the pain, I think, because it's a bit like Swift folks who came to Swift early, Swift 1, Swift 2, Swift 2.2, but everything before 3, basically. Because when, if you did that, if you come from Objective-C to Swift 1, Yes, it was different. Yes, you had closures and generics and stuff, which is great. But you also used APIs that were effectively Objective-C APIs. They were the same method names being used for Swift almost across the board, which is really, really cool. Now, if you come to Swift after Swift 3, you had to learn the language and generics and all these features and so forth. And now also, all those method names you knew previously, they're mostly gone replaced with Swiftier versions. So the jump was higher for folks coming to Swift from Objective-C around Swift 3 and easier for folks in Swift 1. And the same will be true for Swift UI. They're going to add, of course, hopefully collection views or text views or all the missing things that we want right now. The vast majority of it will come in, in June. But they're also going to add new things, things that aren't in UI Kit, things that are new to Swift UI. And it'll just raise the bar higher and higher to start learning it. And so if someone can get to the point today where they can follow along and make a trivial app, you know, make a to-do app or make a a recipes app, whatever it is, something that uses the internet and shows the results and uses a navigation control or whatever, the standard kind of iOS basics features, if you can make that work, understand why it's working and what it's doing, that's enough. You haven't got to ship your app. You haven't got to turn over to SwiftUI full-time. At least make the jump to SwiftUI now, while it's easy, ahead of time before June, when SwiftUI 2 comes out, what are we going to call this thing, with new stuff and better stuff. Make it easy for you. Do it for you. Be selfish. I think a great example of this was going from Objective-C, where it was more or less, I don't know if dynamic typed is the word, but everything in Objective-C was like, you know, it could be whatever object it is because everything was a pointer. And you would check for null just by saying, you know, is this null or not in a simple if statement. You go to Swift, everything is very strongly typed to the point where we have optionals, for instance. We have all these cool ways of checking for optionals with like if let, for instance. And that was like a whole new paradigm and changed the way you thought about building apps on the iPhone. Once you got over that hump, it becomes a lot easier to then pick up all the new stuff that came out with Swift 4, Swift 5, etc. And I think with Swift UI, it's the same idea. And I think what you're getting at is like, we're going away from the like delegate pattern and a lot of the stuff that we kind of inherited from Objective-C and moving over to this uh, functional reactive pattern, moving away from like MVC to more like MVVM. And some of that stuff and getting that pattern down, I think is very helpful in the future, regardless of, I remember over the summer looking at your website and seeing all the different changes to <laughs> all the different property raptors and how they kept changing the names and stuff, you know, for instance, like that stuff may change and like we may get collection views, but at the end of the day, the future is going to be this idea of like 
functional reactive programming and MVVM more so than worrying about the necessarily like syntax changes or new widgets that they bring in. Does that sound about right? It was a great surprise. I mean, you've got to imagine folks at DubDub watching the SwiftUI stuff be announced. And you're sort of seeing a whole new way of writing code. You know, it, it's list, it's image, it's text, it's navigation view and so forth. New actual UI controls and how they're structured, how they're positioned to make results. That's one set of new things we were looking at at DubDub. But at the same time was, of course, all the Swift 5.1 changes. The, you know, your at state, your at environment objects and similar. Also the dollar signs, get bindings and similar for projected values and the wrappers. So we had to handle these two sets of very large changes simultaneously. But that's going to grow and carry on growing. And it's not going to stop. This is obviously the future of all Apple platform development now is SwiftUI. And so, yes, it absolutely is. Make it easier yourself. Learn it now because it's going to get bigger. Not going to get smaller ever again. What are some other skills in Swift that you think people forget about or like don't pay enough attention to? Because obviously everybody's like talking about Swift UI right now. What do you think is missing as far as what you see people not upgrading their skills at when it comes to Swift? Oh, that's easy. That's the easiest question so far because yeah, I don't know whether it's a result of our heritage, early app store, everyone wants to make a fart app, ha ha, we're great. <laughs> I don't know what the actual reason for this is, but iOS and Swift is significantly, significantly behind most other platforms when it comes to testing. Inexplicably so. If you look at like a Ruby code base or a Java code base, you're going to find so much more testing as standard in there. I mean, it's so common to see an iOS project where the only test in there is the one that Xcode generates for you as part of its template. Like, you know, example test here, replaces your own code kind of thing. And that's it. Folks in our community do not take testing seriously. And I've seen the results of that when I've done code reviews with other people. And it makes a hideous, confused, hard to maintain code. We just don't seem to assign it the weight that other communities do, which is a real shame because when you have tests, when you have good, solid tests, you could make any change you want in any part of your code safely, knowing for sure it's going to work because your tests passed before, they passed afterwards, you're safe. And that's amazing. We just don't seem to do that in our community for some reason. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned testing because uh, a few weeks ago we had Alex Bush on, we did our developer wish list for 2020. And one of the things he talked about was how much healthier the like Ruby community is and Ruby is as far as like testing. And he talked about Guard specifically, but I kind of hope, I feel like this is a bit naive that like people will be practicing testing along with combine and Swift UI, but I totally agree. I think the testing stuff, people forget about it and they don't implement like the right patterns and practices in their architecture in order to make testing a lot easier in the future. But to me, it's inexplicable. I mean, if you want to do it anywhere, you'd do it here. Because you know, if you're doing Ruby code, Ruby doesn't change that much. Ruby is a fairly static language. There's not a lot of churn and stuff. Look at the iOS world every year. For the last 13 years, we've had major, major groundbreaking changes from Apple. Now, even iOS 12, a really small release, still had things like Siri shortcuts. They weren't hanging around with it. And of course, 13 is a, a huge, epic set of changes. So every year, we have these monolithic, massive changes across all platforms simultaneously. Then we have, by the way, two, if not three times a year, Swift changes. Swift stuff's changing and breaking and so forth. And then you have your own bugs to fix. And of course, at some point, your boss is saying, hey, we've got to add some actual revenue important features to earn some more money. So I don't think any industry has more pressure on it to innovate quickly, to stay up with the crowd than we have in the mobile development space. So if anyone should be doing this, it will be us. I mean, imagine, I know I haven't imagined, I know it exists, folks who haven't got tests, who then when a new phone comes out, which is every year, every single year a new phone comes out. <laughs> That's my prediction for the year, is that a new phone will come out. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the 10R or the 11 Pro or the 11 Pro Max, it changes the shapes and sizes all the time. If you haven't got a way of testing that your code works on these new devices, which is happening every single year, as is 
Dub Dub, as is Swift, as is your own stuff. There's four massive things happening every single year. How can you survive without testing? I just don't know. I've got no idea how people do it. Do you think that's a problem with the community or do you think Apple doesn't provide enough support? Yes. It's a, it, you would think definitely more on the community. It's both. Apple have a very, very small testing team. They've managed to ship Swift UI with very little testing support. In fact, we just do our standard sort of UI tests that we've always had before, which is silly because if you look at the React space in the web, they have a virtual DOM. They say, here's my HTML I want to render, render it virtually for me as if it was really being rendered, and then test this is the case. Test my, that has three bullet points, whatever you want to do. In Swift UI, we have to actually load the simulator, present the screen, push to the next screen, press a button, whatever, manually ticking along to check that the output looks right. And that's silly because Swift UI is all completely functional reactive. Which you better say, yeah, virtually render my views, virtually click that button, and then check this is the case. And it should be taking you know a thousandth of a second to do these tests versus five to ten seconds to do these tests. So Apple really has a long history of ignoring tests. They have a very long history of having manual testing inside Apple. There are some folks who do write tests, of course there are, but from what I understand, the vast majority don't. And that filters out. That absolutely filters out. They set the tone for our community. They don't take it seriously. Neither do we as a community. And that isn't great. And it was about something that Ash Furrow tweeted about, or actually blogged about previously, which is the idea of um, the Apple community and the JavaScript community being more like someone renting a house and someone owning a house. When we rent our little iOS development house, we kind of expect Apple to do things for us. We need better testing. Who's going to do it? Apple's going to do it. We need better architecture. Who's going to do it? Apple, and so forth. And versus in, in JavaScript, where we say, how do you want to test? Do you want to use Jest, or do you want to use Jasmine? What tools do you want to use? Do you want to use Angular? Do you want to use React? You know, there, there's many, 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 many choices in the web space, and that's good and bad. But it's because they're innovating so much by themselves, because there is no landlord to make things for them. They've got to do it. So it's very, very aggressively community-driven. I think the testing, that works really well. Yeah, I mean, the big problem, obviously, is that our IDE is owned by Apple. Once we get around to that, I think it could be easier for the community to build more tools. I feel like that's like the biggest friction. Whereas with JavaScript, it's like, oh, I want to use Sublime Text. I want to use Atom. I want to use VS Code. I can just do it from the command line. It's a lot easier to just build custom tools. And like the unfortunate thing is, I don't know what the future is going to hold, but like Combine and Swift UI, especially Combine, is not like open source. So that becomes an even greater challenge for anybody to write a custom testing tool around something like that. That doesn't excuse the fact that the community doesn't test enough because obviously there's a lot of other code that could be tested. But You've got to keep in mind that we had a great way to hack on Xcode previously. It was Alcatraz, a way of adding our own custom extensions. And Apple killed it. Yeah. You can't use that anymore. And, you know, I really hoped last year would be the year where we saw Xcode extensions. I don't mean the source editor extensions, which are tiny. Right. The ability to control stuff is so, so small. Right. I thought last year would be the year, finally, real Xcode extensions. And actually, I'm hoping, again, this year, because they can't do another iOS 13. They can't do 14. Hey, everything's changed again. They can't do that because no one liked it. It was really, really on fire last year. Yes, so it was. So iOS 13.3 before it actually was stable. <laughs> They can't do that again. So this year would be a great time to consolidate. Let's look at testing. Let's look at extensions in Xcode. And that'd be amazing because it would allow all of us to start filling in gaps. I'm going to make a weird prediction, but I kind of think they're going to like rewrite Xcode at some point because I kind of feel like it's at the point where iTunes is or was where it was just like it's bloated with a lot of like old history and legacy stuff that... Almost at some point, I could see them just come out with a new ID, essentially, especially if they want to like move to other devices. So, well, they've started doing the whole replace thing when they changed the source editor, I want to say three years ago or so, maybe two years ago, whenever it was. That was a new one written in Swift for the iPad, for Swift Playgrounds, and then ported to Xcode. So that's why it immediately got weirdly 10 times faster and scrolled really quickly right, and right. so forth. Okay ditched a whole editor, put a new one in. So they can do it, and they are doing it. 
whether or not it'll be a more sort of root and branch tear out. Like recently, I was doing this thing, um, 100 Days Swift UI, and I had to explain to folks how to get to their target settings in Xcode. And it's something, if you've used it before, you know where it is. You know you click on this thing, and I click there, click there, click there. But explaining it to someone in practice who's never done it, you know, in text, is really hard. And that's a good sign that you've got some problems because you say, okay, go to the project navigator. If that's hidden, press like command one, then go to your project name in there, but you'll see there's a blue icon and a yellow icon, not the yellow one, <laughs> press the blue one. Okay, press the blue one. And now you'll be in project settings. You'll see either the words product and targets hidden, or sorry, showing on the screen in a project and targets list, or that'll be hidden, and it'll be available in a drop-down menu saying terminal, you're gonna press that, then choose a target, or so forth. And it's all different and unique and customizable, and it's just too much. It's really, really hard to find your target settings for the very first time. Sounds like you have a new idea for a book to come out. Just that alone is like <laughs> complicated enough. But the thing is, they have this menu, file, project settings. And it's useless. No one ever goes there, or very rarely goes there. I think I've maybe been there once ever to say, hey, this is useless, a dub dub. And that's a shame because these things go to your target settings. It's really important. So why not make it easier? Speaking of Xcode, so there's a lot of stuff that folks can learn as far as tech skills outside of just Xcode itself. You know, you and I both heard Abby's talk in Toronto, and Abby was a guest a, a few weeks ago. So there's a lot with Xcode and knowing how to organize your projects, I think, is a really great skill to learn the whole modularization aspect. But I think, like, speaking of tech skills, like, I think that there's stuff like Git, for instance, which I don't think Xcode does a very good job with. It's okay, but it's better than nothing. But I'm a big user of the terminal when it comes to Git. And of course, the terminal itself is a huge tool for developers that they can learn and just writing bash scripts sometimes is super helpful to me. And I've, I've done that quite a bit. Yeah. So I've been using the terminal for a long time now. And uh, I have become deeply accustomed, in fact, really ingrained into my brain how it works to the point where I was given Tower, Tower Git. And I couldn't use it. I tried to yeah. use it. And, and like, I don't know what's going on here. I'm in the same boat. Like, uh, these Git. GUIs, they're good. Like, there's a lot of stuff I can do that's easier, especially when it comes to like merging or okay. comparing different versions of a file. But yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat where it's just like, if I'm going to do Git, I'm going to do it in the terminal at this point. Yeah. And in some respects, that shouldn't be the case, right? I should be flexible. I'm flexible. I can, I can drop UI kit tomorrow into Swift UI. I can switch to Python or Swift or any other language fairly freely. But for some reason, some tools are hard grained in my head. And that's not a good thing, I don't think. Right. But, you know, these 15 to 20 git commands, those are the only ones I know, <laughs> bluntly. <laughs> you know, I can cherry pick, tag, branch, and so forth. But when it comes to the more advanced, obscure stuff, I have to look it up. And I very rarely use it. So I rely on those things. I know they work. My muscle memory is very, very strong. And it's not ideal, but that's how it is. But it means that I, I don't ever worry about git. Git for me is never a liability. It's always a tool. And the same is true for a vast range of terminal commands I use regularly and have done for a very long time. I've been using BSD and Linux for you know 20 something years now. So I'm happily confident those tools will be continue to be around in 20 more years because they aren't going anywhere. They aren't changing the eternal tools as they were. And the same is true for regular expressions, by the way, because those are also fairly old, how they work. They are completely timeless. When you learn them once, you can use them in, in every coding language, including Swift, JavaScript, Python, PHP, you name it. They all use regular expressions. So it's a skill you pick up once, and as a meta skill for developers, will last you a very, very long time. So before we end the discussion on tech skills, what do you think about picking up particular APIs or building on special devices? Like, you know, the Mac, we still use the Mac quite a bit, or the Apple Watch, I mean, that seems to be growing quite a bit. And hopefully the app ecosystem is going to continue to improve. Is there a particular API or device that you think people should also focus on? I think each platform brings its own excitement, its own advantages, its own opportunities. I mean, the Mac is an extraordinary capable platform. You know, when you have that sort of fine-grained control 
over the mouse cursor. You've got a huge screen really to work with, multiple windows, multiple competing applications at the same time, all running. So Mac's great fun to work with to really push your skills hard. Of course, you have, you know, 32 or 64 gigs of RAM to work with as well. Mm -hmm. The watch, the complete opposite. You've got a tiny screen. You've got tiny resources. You've got tiny amount of user interaction time, like two or three seconds at a time. So that itself is like writing a haiku. You've got to try and write in a small amount of space and make the most of what time you have. And there's uh, the TV. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> and there's the TV. <laughs> If you want to make your own streaming service, there you go. I've got a book on tvOS, and I've written some apps for it, and it's fun, but it doesn't provide the same level as, you know, writing for iOS. I can make remarkable things in half an hour or an hour. I get a whole thing on Swift on Sundays. We built apps from scratch for, for 20 weeks in, in about an hour, an hour and a half each. That's what you could do in iOS. And same for watchOS. I love it because it's everywhere with you, and that alone presents interesting it also uh, has really interesting sensors do. on it as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you can do some great things with it. I made a sprite kit game for WatchOS. It's great fun. And it just used the wheel. And what happened was there was like, a, in the center was a circle with four quadrant colors, like yellow, blue, green, and red. And as you turned the wheel, those the circles span around, so the quadrants face in different directions. And then um, from each corner would appear colored balls, like yellow, red, green, and blue balls. And to make sure the yellow ball hit the yellow quadrant by turning the little digital crown fast enough. And it's basically, you're never going to sit there, yeah, that's brilliant, I want to play that game. But let's face it, if you forget your phone one day and you want to go to the bathroom, right, right. <laughs> what are you going to do, you know? Um, so, But it's fun, and it's enjoyable to work with. And the same is true with the Mac. The Mac is a great, greatly enjoyable platform to work with. I do enjoy making it for the Mac. And I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier. If you're looking at like going for a particular position and a company like for instance is really integrated with HealthKit, then it might make sense to upgrade your skills like on the Apple Watch, but that might not necessarily be helpful as wide of an audience of employers. If that's what you're looking at, then perhaps the iPhone is because like the fact of the matter is billions of people use iPhones, whereas the numbers on who uses an Apple Watch and who uses a custom app on an Apple Watch uh, is pretty insignificant in comparison. It is. I encourage folks to be curious, I think. And that's not, not just curious about platforms. It's curious about everything because years ago, I used to do games for Xbox 360. And there were some APIs in there that were gorgeous, really, really, really carefully crafted for maximum performance. And you could do beautiful things in a few lines of code. And I actually took those APIs and sort of did a clean room re-engineer of them in Python for Linux at the time. Just I loved them so much, I wanted them somewhere else. I used them on Linux and wrote this library to use the same API elsewhere because I liked it that much. But it taught me a new way of thinking about building games I wouldn't otherwise have thought about. And that has now sat in my brain. I'd use a similar approach elsewhere. And if I had just sat in Objective C at the time or Swift today, just used Xcode, just used UIKit, I'd be limiting myself, limiting my awareness of what's out there. Because there are some incredible ideas out there. And honestly, we should be stealing all of them. Take all the good ideas. Because the Swift team do. If you look at like the evolution on the proposals and GitHub, you can see alternatives considered. And it'll say, well, in Rust they do this, in Haskell they do this, in C they do this, in PHP they do this. And they'll go through and say, well, this one's great, this one sucks, and so forth. And they base their choice on prior art. And of course, there are new things that no one's done before, fine. But places that are prior art, it's really helpful because you can say here, they had this for raw strings in Python, which they looked at in, in their proposal for Swift. And it kind of worked, but it falls down here, here, and here. So they thieve shamelessly from other languages. And the best bit is now, you look at C Sharp 8, they're sealing from Swift. They're having optionals in there now. So it's great. It goes round and round and round. And we all improve. We all get better. So be curious. And if that means watchOS or macOS or even, even tvOS or even Python, fine. Just be curious and try things out. Don't sit there thinking that Swift has everything. The Xcode is the ultimate IDE. There are other great languages and other great platforms and steal from all of them. I agree. One of the best ways I've learned how to pick up skills is by adding like an extra challenge to it in some way. And like recently, I've been talking about the Heart Twitch app that I've been building for the watch and using server-side Swift as well. And that's like a really odd 
set of technologies, but it was a great opportunity for me to learn Swift UI and independent watch app and all the different idiosyncrasies there. And I think you've really hit a great point with like staying fresh, staying curious is probably one of the greatest advantages you can have to continue to upgrade and practice those skills in various ways. Yeah, you'll hear folks saying, well, I haven't had a chance to use Swift UI yet. Well, make a chance. <laughs> if you actually want to use it, you will make a chance to use it. Organize a hack day, a hackathon, a FedEx day, whatever you call these things, organize one of these at your company. Next month, for one day, we're all going to sit and make our own Swift UI app for something. I don't care what. You will learn stuff extremely quickly. You'll share ideas, and the company will hopefully benefit. So one thing I wanted to ask also is, what can employers or CTOs or managers do to help their employees upgrade their skills? I think they've got to find a way to be effective in training. because. There's a lot of training out there, of course there is, a lot of opportunities out there, but being effective, you know, getting the most value for money is surprisingly hard, actually. And so the best way I've seen again, again, and again, is say, listen, here is some training budget. You know, not a lot, maybe two or three thousand dollars per person. So maybe five percent of their salary, whatever it is you're paying them. Not a lot realistically, compared to, you know, a desk and a computer and a trainer and, and a pension program and so forth. Um, not a lot. But here is a fixed sum of money, a pot every year. It'll go away every 12 months. You've got to use it. And it's yours to spend on your training. And they might say, well, for me, I, I'm very sociable. I, I love by networking. I want to go to a conference. They might use that money to fly to the nearest uh, conference for a couple of days, stay overnight, whatever. That's how they might, they might choose, choose to use it. Or they might sign up to a... a a, a video subscription, or they might buy some books. But give them the chance to have their own say on what training looks like, because it, you'll find everyone learns differently, and they'll know, they'll absolutely know how they want to use that money. And because it's going to go away if it isn't used, they have an incentive to use it. They're going to say, yeah, I've always wanted this book, or I wanted to go to this, this event. They're going to use it. And it will help you, because not only will staff feel, yeah, I'm getting my training, I'm advancing my career, even if the, the code I'm working on is quite mature, I'm learning new things, I'm trying new things, I'm meeting new people. So it helps them and it makes them feel good. But ideally also they come back and then share what they've learned or they pass around the book that they bought or they hold lunch and learn sessions where they present the highlights of Dub Dub 19, whatever it is they've been to, um, making sure everyone benefits from that. So it can actually accumulate a lot of benefit in a very, very small amount of time. Yeah, I can't agree with that more. Like just being out there and meeting other people is um, super helpful. Thank you so much, Paul, for coming on the show. Is there anything else you want to mention as far as ways that folks can practice their skills? Or is there like a particular course or book that you would recommend? Well, I've mentioned testing already, and I've got a book on that, which is cunningly called Testing Swift. And it goes into... UI testing, integration testing, unit testing, mocking, spying, dummies, and so forth. But there's a lot of information in there to really accelerate your testing knowledge to get it where it wants to be. I have another book called Swift Design Patterns, which is very, very consciously not a gang of four design patterns book ported to Swift. Because there are a few of those are out there already, and I really did not want to write that book. Because the gang of four book, the very famous design patterns book, is awesome, but it's also almost... 20 or 30 years old now. It's an old book now, and it's written for small talk. So the things it introduces often aren't really patterns anymore, at least not the way we'd use them. They're not idiomatic to our platforms. So my book, Swift Design Patterns, is about, you know, what are the idiomatic patterns from Apple's platforms or from Swift that you really do want to use? But actually, most recently, just last week, in fact, I released a new book called Swift for Good. And it's a different kind of book to what I've written at all before because it's 20 different authors contribute to chapters. So one chapter per author on whatever they want to talk about, you know, whatever they thought was most relevant to Swift developers today. And that's, you know, great by itself. You get 20 different ideas, 20 different chapters from people, which is great. But the really important thing in this book, where the name comes from, is because all of us were writing and putting these things forward free. It's all pro bono. We didn't take a penny of pay for what we did which means that the entire sales revenue for the book, which is 40 bucks minus you know, PayPal transaction fees, whatever it is, or 39 bucks maybe, goes to charity. 
So the charity we're working with is called Black Girls Code, and they're getting $39 out of every sale. And we're already raised about $55,000 so far for them. That's awesome. And it's been on sale a week. Yeah, I highly recommend checking out that book. Thank you so much, Paul, for coming on the show. Where can people find you online? So the website is hackingwithswift.com. If you have questions, you can tweet me. I am Two Straws, T-W-O Straws on Twitter. I am Two Straws on Reddit and on Stack Overflow. So I'm pleased to find remember that first part. And if you really want to, you can email me. I am paul at hackingwithswift.com. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you for the invite. Folks can find me on Twitter at Leo G. Dion. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and let me know. I'd love to hear your feedback as well as if you can put a review in Apple Podcast or Spotify or whatever player you use, I would really appreciate it. And we look forward to talking to you again. 